Chapter 2, Opening History of Prison Elmira, the queen city of the southern tier, was at the opening of the war in 1861, a thriving town of about 15,000 inhabitants. Its advantageous location soon brought it into prominence, and its atmosphere and surroundings very soon assumed a decidedly military character, which was maintained till the last gun was fired and the war ended. Business activity boomed the town, and on the 28th day of March 1864, Elmira assumed the dignity of a city. The first call for troops issued by President Lincoln on April 15, 1861, reached Elmira on the afternoon of that day. A call was at once made for a meeting to be held the same evening in Concert Hall, located on Lake Street, just north of Water. At the appointed hour, the hall was densely packed with citizens whose blood was up. Honorable Gabriel L. Smith was made chairman of the meeting. The orators of the evening were Judge James Dunn, Archibald Robertson, Daniel F. Pickering, and General W.M. Gregg. Volunteers were called for, and W.M. Halliday, R.R.R. DeMars, and S.B. Denton were made a committee to receive names. Most of the company known as the Southern Tier Rifles volunteered at once and became Company K of the 23rd Regiment. Elmira at once became a military rendezvous, and Lieutenant W. W. Averill, later Major General, was the first U.S. officer sent to Elmira to muster troops. Captain J. L. Tidball succeeded him, followed by Major Arthur T. Lee. Among those coming later, whose names afterward became more familiar through residence after the war, were Captain J. Riley Reed, Captain Madison Earl, Captain David Scott, Captain Liscombe, Captain Mills, and Captain William Falk, all of whom found wives in Elmira, and some reached great military prominence later. The first regiments to be mustered in were the 12th New York Volunteers on May 13th, the 13th New York Volunteers on May 14th, and the 23rd New York Volunteers on May 16th, which latter was composed largely of Elmira citizens. On July 30th, 1861, by order of Governor Morgan, Elmira was made one of the three military depots of the state, the others being at Albany and New York City. Brigadier General Van Valkenburg was appointed commanding officer and Colonel Chase C.B. Walker quartermaster. At the same time, Elmira was made a depot of the general government, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman, with Captain Seidman as quartermaster and Captain Sappington as commissary, the two latter serving as such for nearly the whole period of the war. Three large camps were created, known as Barracks No. 1, located in the Arnett Field, south of Washington Avenue and east of Lake Street. Barracks No. 2, located in the Old Fifth Ward near the present site of the Northern Central RR Shops, and Barracks No. 3, located on West Water Street above Hoffman Street. In process of time, a general hospital was built on Davis Street near Clinton, and another on William Street near Church. The commissary storehouse was located on the southeast corner of Railroad Avenue, then called Wisner Street, and Church Street, on the spot now occupied by the Barton and Whedon Building and the Silsby Building. The old building, which for many years occupied the ground between these buildings, but was torn down in the fall of 1911, was a part of this wartime storehouse. From May 1861 to May 1864, Elmira was the scene of much military activity. Regiments of soldiers were mustered and drilled before being sent to the front. Finally, in 1863, it became the draft rendezvous. In the early part of 1864, it was found that barracks number three were practically empty, and the government immediately grasped the opportunity of utilizing them for a prison camp. The first record of the birth of the Elmira prison camp is given in the following official correspondence. Adjutant General's Office, Washington, May 14, 1864. Colonel Hoffman, Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Sir, I am today informed that there are quite a number of barracks at Elmira, New York, which are not occupied and are fit to hold rebel prisoners. Quite a large number of those lately captured could be accommodated at this place. I give you this information for you to make such use of it as you think proper. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, E.D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General. Washington, D.C., May 14, 1864. Honorable E.M. Stanton, Secretary of War, Washington, D.C. Sir, I have the honor to report that there are now about 10,000 prisoners of war at Point Lookout 
where 5,000 more may be accommodated. I do not think it would be advisable to keep a greater number at that point and to provide for an addition to the number now in our hands, which may soon be expected. I respectfully suggest that one set of the barracks at Elmira may be appropriated to this purpose. I am informed there are barracks there available which have, by crowding, received 12,000 volunteers. By fencing them in at a cost of about $2,000, they may be relied on to receive 8,000 or possibly 10,000 prisoners. They can be shipped directly from Belle Plaine on steamers already ordered for the purpose to New York and thence to railroad to Elmira, which will not make the transportation very expensive. Fort Delaware can accommodate a few more officers, but no more enlisted men. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry, and Commander General of Prisoners. Office Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C., May 19, 1864. Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman, Commanding Draft Rendezvous, Elmira, New York. Colonel, you will receive instructions from the Adjutant General to set apart the barracks on the Shemung River at Elmira as a depot for prisoners of war. The barracks will be enclosed by a suitable fence, and I would respectfully suggest that you construct it after the style found to be most secure at other depots. It should be 11 or 12 feet high, the frame being on the outside, with a walk for sentinels on the outside 3 or 4 feet below the top, thus giving them a good view of all that passes within. There should be ample room between the fence and the buildings, that prisoners may not approach it unseen. Two gates will probably be sufficient, one toward the river. The guards should be outside the enclosure. Please report on the condition of the barracks the cost of the fence, and any other additions which may be required, and the number of prisoners the place will accommodate. From what I have heard, I judge that the number will be 8,000 or 10,000. I am unable to say how soon the barracks will be required, but possibly within 10 days. I enclose a circular of regulations for the government of military prisoners. I am Colonel, very respectfully, W. Hoffman, Colonel 3rd Infantry and Commissary General of Prisoners. Headquarters, Draft Rendezvous, Elmira, New York, May 23, 1864. Colonel W. Hoffman, Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Colonel, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication dated May 19, 1864, in reference to the barracks at this point that have been set aside as a depot for prisoners of war, and requesting me to report the condition of them, etc. There are two sets of barracks at this post, situated about two miles apart. They are designated as number 1 and 3. The latter is on the Shemung River and is set to be used for prisoners of war. These barracks will be built to comfortably accommodate 3,000 troops without crowding. The bunks are double. The buildings are in excellent condition and well ventilated. 4,000 prisoners of war could be quartered in them, and there is plenty of ground room in which tents could be pitched to accommodate 1,000 more. The mess room is sufficiently large to seat 1,200 or 1,500 and the kitchen can cook daily for 5,000. There is an excellent bakery that can bake daily 6,000 rations. There is no hospital at these barracks, hence hospital tents will have to be used for the sick. A new hospital for 200 patients is being erected about one mile from the barracks. The guardhouse is a building 75 by 45 feet, now used to hold deserters, and will have to be used for that purpose until another can be built at barracks number one. The number of troops now here is entirely inadequate to guard a large number of prisoners, being only three companies of the Veteran Reserve Corps, numbering about 200 men. A fence 12 feet high was commenced today and will probably be completed in 10 days, surrounding the barracks. I respectfully request that six copies of circular or regulations for the government of military prisoners be forwarded to me. Also such blanks as may be required to make returns. I would recommend that no prisoners be sent here until I report that the barracks are ready to receive them. I am Colonel, very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, Commanding Depot. In establishing the fence, it is advisable, if practicable, to enclose ground enough to accommodate in barracks and tents 10,000 prisoners. Please report in detail what will be necessary to put the place in condition for this service including tents for the guards, tents for prisoners, kitchens for prisoners, which should be fitted up with farmer's boilers of from 30 to 120 gallons. 
according to convenience, etc., giving as far as practicable the cost. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry, and Commander General of Prisoners. Headquarters, Draft Rendezvous, Elmira, New York, June 30th, 1864. Brigadier General L. Thomas, Adjutant General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. General, I have the honor to report this post in a very good condition. Barracks and grounds are in excellent police. Subsistence good. Barracks number three has been set aside for the accommodation of prisoners of war and is enclosed by a fence 12 feet high with sentry boxes on the outside, the platform being four feet below the top of the fence. These barracks are now ready to receive prisoners. On their arrival, the recruits and drafted men will occupy barracks number one. It will be necessary to keep in the guardhouse at number three barracks until another can be built at barracks number one, all prisoners sent here as deserters. I respectfully request that I may have authority to erect a guardhouse at barracks number one with as little delay as possible. There being no quarters inside the enclosure of barracks number three, the officers having charge of the prisoners will go into tents, and I have directed the quartermaster to issue wall tents to them, which I respectfully ask the adjutant general to approve. There are about 12 officers here that I can assign to duty with prisoners, and as there will be about 50 companies of 200 men each in it, it will be necessary to have more officers on duty at this post. There should be one officer to every company if possible, and officers who are unfit for field service can perform this duty as well as able-bodied ones. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, USA, Commanding Rendezvous. Office Assistant Quartermaster, Elmira, New York, June 30, 1864. Brigadier General M.C. Miggs, Quartermaster General, Washington, D.C. General, I have the honor of informing you that Barracks No. 3 has been placed in complete condition for the accommodation of 10,000 prisoners and the necessary guard. Eight acres of land have been enclosed with a substantial board fence 12 feet high with sentry boxes and elevated platforms so that the guards can overlook the whole ground have been constructed. Wells have been sunk and all the necessary arrangements made for the immediate occupation should it be required. The general hospital also is completed and ready for the accommodation of 200 patients. A plan or drawing of these premises will be forwarded as soon as it can be prepared. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, J.J. Elwell, Captain and Assistant Quartermaster. It will be noted that the above report says eight acres of land were enclosed as a prison. As other published reports or statements have varied in the number of acres, it is apparent that it has been guesswork on the part of those who made the statements. To determine the fact, the author himself measured the plot and finds as follows. The face line on Water Street measures about 1,200 feet. The west line from Water Street running at right angle to the Water Street line about 800 feet. The south line, running on an angle of about 120 degrees to the river, measures about 1,000 feet. The total of these figures equals 3,000 feet. Lieutenant Colonel Eastman constructed, as he states, about 3,000 feet of stockade. Therefore, the measurement tallies with the fence. Any reader can figure out the problem, the answer to which is between 28 and 30 acres. As the south line runs off at an angle, the actual contents of the prison was very close to 30 acres. Deducting the space occupied by Foster's Pond, there was a net surface of about 29 acres. This is not guesswork and can be accepted as final. The hospital referred to in Captain Elwell's letter might be understood to mean a prison hospital. This would be an error. The general hospital referred to was located one mile from the prison camp at the corner of Davis and Clinton Streets, and was for the use of U.S. troops only. The first order for the movement of prisoners to Elmira is as follows. Office Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C., June 30, 1864. Colonel A.G. Draper, Commanding Point Lookout. Colonel, by authority of the Secretary of War, you will forward from Point Lookout to Elmira, New York, via New York City, 2,000 enlisted prisoners to be delivered to Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman, Commanding Draft Rendezvous Barracks. The prisoners will be divided into parties of about 400, each party to be accompanied by a guard of 100 men under a proper complement of officers. 
Give the officers in charge detailed instructions as directed in my letter of 21st instruction. Cooked rations will be furnished for two days to guard and prisoners. Arrangements will be made for cooking on a steamer as far as possible. The guard will return to Point Lookout on Harrisburg and Baltimore Railroads. The depot quartermaster in this city will furnish transports at intervals of two or three days. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel 3rd Infantry and Commander General of Prisoners. This completes the official correspondence of the government in relation to the prison camp and brings us to the actual opening at Elmira, the first official act connected therewith being the following. Headquarters, Draft Rendezvous, Elmira, New York, July 2, 1864. Special Order 251. By direction of the Secretary of War, Barracks No. 3 has been set aside for the accommodation of prisoners of war. It will accordingly be vacated by all troops now occupying it. The 16th VR Corps will encamp on the ground already selected outside of the enclosure. All recruits, drafted men, and substitutes will be removed Tuesday morning, July 5th, to barracks number 1. But prisoners now confined in the guardhouse will remain there for the present. Colonel Chas M. Provo, 16th VR Corps, will take command of the camp outside the enclosure, around the barracks, and of the troops encamping there for the purpose of guard. Major Henry V. Colt, 104th NYV, will relieve Lt. Col. Stephen Moore, 16th VRC, in command of Barracks No. 3, and will receive and take charge of all prisoners as they arrive. The following officers are detailed for duty with prisoners of war, and will report to Major H. V. Colt, commanding Barracks No. 3, for duty without delay. Captain C. C. Barton, Captain Benji Munger, Captain G. O. W. Kramer, Captain R. 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 DeMars, Captain G.L. Witten, Captain W.M. Peck, Lieutenant R.J. Whitney, Lieutenant I.A. Richmond, Lieutenant Myron M. Schertz, Lieutenant John McConnell, Lieutenant John Chickenden, Lieutenant James Haver, and Lieutenant R.J. McKee. The prisoners, as soon as they arrive, will be formed into companies, each of which will be under charge of a commissioned officer detailed for the purpose. One enlisted man will also be detailed with each company to act as orderly sergeant. The officer in charge of prisoners of war will comply strictly with the requirements of the circular from the Office of the Commissary General of Prisoners, dated Washington, D.C., April 20, 1864. Letters sent to prisoners of war will in all cases be brought to headquarters for examination before being taken to the barracks for delivery. Letters from prisoners of war must also be brought to these headquarters for a similar examination before they are forwarded. Sergeant Major Charles W. Rhodes is appointed to examine all communications sent to or by prisoners of war. By command of S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel USA, commanding rendezvous. By T. R. Lounsbury, Lieutenant and AAG. The following general instructions and information were issued on the same date by Colonel Eastman. Rule 21. When prisoners are seriously ill, their nearest relatives, being loyal, may be permitted to make them short visits, but under no circumstances will visitors be admitted without authority of the commanding general of prisons. The hospital will be under charge of senior medical officer present, who will be held responsible for the good order and treatment of the sick to the commanding officer. A fund will be created as for other hospitals. It will be expended for additional delicacies and rarities and when large enough can defray from expense of washing clothes, articles for policing purposes, and all articles indispensable to promote the health of the hospitals. Surgeons in charge report semi-monthly the deaths of prisoners, their place of internment, and number of grave. All monies and valuables of deceased prisoners will be placed in the prison fund. The clothing, if of any value, will be given to other prisoners. The prison fund will be made up by the difference of the prisoner's ration given below and that allowed by law to soldiers of the U.S. Army. Rations for prisoners. Pork or bacon, 14 ounces. Fresh beef, 14 ounces. Flour or soft bread, 16 ounces. Hard bread, 14 ounces. Cornmeal, 15 ounces. And to each 100 rations, beans or peas, 12 and a half pounds. Rice or hominy, 8 pounds. Soap, 4 pounds. Vinegar, 3 quarts. Salt, 3 and 3 fourths pounds. 
Potatoes, 15 pounds. Sugar in coffee or tea will be issued only to the sick or wounded on the recommendation of the surgeon in charge at the rate of sugar, 12 pounds, coffee ground, 5 pounds, or coffee green, 7 pounds, tea, 1 pound, to each 100 rations. The regular prisoner's ration will be increased in quantity and also include tea, coffee, sugar, and molasses for those employed in public works about the camp. They will also be allowed compensation from the prison fund, mechanics 10 cents per day, and laborers 5 cents, the amount to be placed to their credit or paid in tobacco to those who desire it. With the prison fund may be purchased such articles as may be needful for the health and proper condition of the prisoners. The sutler for the prisoners is allowed to furnish certain prescribed articles at reasonable rates for which he pays a tax to the prison fund. All money in the hands of prisoners when they arrive will be taken by the officers in charge and returned when they are released. Prisoners will be allowed to write and receive letters, not exceeding one page of letter paper, on matters of private nature to be examined by the proper officer. The successive official acts in connection with the formation of a new prison camp have been recorded, and on July 3rd we find everything in readiness for the first act of the drama. The prisoners are on their way, and while waiting for their arrival, let us turn aside a moment to describe their future abode. The Elmira Prison Camp was located on West Water Street, about one mile from the center of the city, and had been known for three years as Barracks No. 3. The camp began at a point very near the edge of a dry run known as Hoffman Creek, in which there is never any water except during a freshet. This creek crossed Water Street, running in a southeasterly direction to the Shemung River. The prison camp extended westward along Water Street about 1,200 feet. The lower or easterly line followed the course of the creek to the river, a distance of about 1,000 feet. On the west end, the line ran at a right angle with Water Street direct to the river, about 800 feet distant. The plot contained about 30 acres. There was in the center of this area a stagnant pond of water from 15 to 30 feet wide, beginning at a point about 20 feet from the stockade fence on the west side and extending below the east stockade. This body of water has always been known as Foster's Pond and remains there to this day, as shown in plate number 53, serving no purpose except as a skating rink for boys in winter before the river freezes over. It is probably the only landmark still remaining which would be recognized by any of the prisoners, excepting perhaps the old Foster homestead, which stood directly opposite the main gateway into the camp. That also remains just as it stood then. There is a sheer drop of 15 feet on the north bank of this pond, and the ground slopes away from Water Street toward the pond, so that the pond is really about 20 feet below Water Street. Between the pond and the river, there is about 300 feet of river bottom. Sandy soil, perfectly dry, except when the river rises more than 6 feet above low water mark. This area comprises a little more than one-third of the entire camp, and is known as the Flat, and will be called so in this history. Whether Foster's Pond is fed by seepage through the sandy soil from the river or by springs, no one seems to know. It has been there since the town was located and is never dry. When the river is low, the pond is also low. The camp, which will be spoken of in this book, comprised about two-thirds of the area and was a fine grassy plot. At the time of its occupation as a prison camp, barracks number three consisted of 35 wooden buildings each about 100 feet long, 16 feet wide, and high enough for two rows of bunks. They stood side by side in a line parallel with Water Street and occupied the center of the high ground between Foster's Pond and Water Street. These barracks were constructed for the occupation of our own volunteers at a time when there was no thought of their ever being occupied by prisoners of war. They were built of good lumber, double boarded with tight roofs and good floors. The floors were elevated nearly two feet from the ground to provide a good circulation of air in summer and to prevent dampness in stormy weather. They were erected in 1861 through 62, when lumber was plenty and a lot better quality than it was possible to obtain in 1864. The condition of these buildings was first class in every particular. The grounds were well kept and in wholesome condition. 
No prisoner of war ever entered a place of confinement better adapted to such use or more pleasant to the eye. This is shown by the description of Mr. Keeley in his book. He says, The whole site is a basin surrounded by hills, which rise several hundred feet and are covered with luxurious growth of hemlock, ash, poplar, and pine. This was a most grateful relief from our point lookout experience, where nothing met our eye in any direction except the sky, water, and prison fence. But a more available and practical improvement was in the water, which is here pure, cool, and abundant, and the newcomers luxuriated in the delicious beverage with the gusto of a lost traveler in Sahara.